Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of In the Spotlight. I am Mike Canici, and I am very honored tonight because I've been a fan of this gentleman for a very long time. You remember him in such films as Adventures in Babysitting, Toy Soldiers. Um, I mean, he's had a list of credits. I mean, he comes from a very big family in acting. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the one and only Keith Coogan. And Keith, I want to thank you for coming on today. It's a real honor. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Great to be on. Appreciate it. So, Keith, um, you know, interestingly enough, I think most people would think that you got into acting because of your grandfather, Jackie. But really, the story I remember that I remember reading about a couple of years ago is you were watching like Sesame Street or something and you just happened to say, I want to be in TV someday. And your mother kind of looked at you and went, no, please like that. So, I mean, is that how it all happened for you? Really? It's just watching that show. Yeah. Uh, and um, it was something that more context is that uh, I didn't have any idea that my family was involved in the business. At all, because right. you're only like uh, four or five, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So must have been something in the DNA. I don't know. I'm a big <laughs> ham. My yeah. whole family were so great. Grandfather was in vaudeville. Great grandmother was in vaudeville. Grandfather started in vaudeville as an infant, basically, and then uh, silent pictures, and he got to see it go to talkies and color and TV, and I got to see it go. Uh, from film to digital and, and what's happening with Netflix. And uh, so, yeah, our family's been doing it. But basically, we're big um, hams, can jump into a room and entertain people. Right. And Keith, um, when I was growing up, I mean, the Adams family was huge in syndication. I mean, reruns, it, it became more popular in reruns. And it was just on, it seemed like it was on every station, whether it was TBS or Fox, and uh, we lost Keith for a second. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so let me ask you, I mean, did you ever get to watch your grandfather in any of those shows? Because, I mean, he was phenomenal as the legendary Uncle Fester. Oh, thank you. Yes, I uh, got to go to the set of, they did a Adam's Family Halloween special. It was recorded. It was, it, um, I shot a video uh in color and uh gomez's brother showed up a brand new character they invented um and like i think fbi guys or something were trying to uh, pin the family down for something so it was awful but everyone was still alive it was before carolyn jones and ted cassidy had passed away yeah. and of course and we lost felix silla uh cousin it recently and uh, it was great. I was a kid. I was probably eight years old, I think, on the set. And um, I already, by that time, I was well aware of Jack and that his big things were the kid and Uncle Fester. And uh, uh, later, I learned all the work he kind of did in between. Um, so we, uh, in L.A., they'll do a marathon on Thanksgiving, a 24-hour Adam's Family Marathon. And after my grandfather passed, we'd gather together and we'd miss him. We'd just put the TV on to the uh, marathon in the other room and then could hear his voice come out every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. And Keith, correct me if I'm wrong. You were about 13 or 14 years old when he passed. So, I mean, were, did you, were you able to ever get advice from him or take any tips sure. from him? I mean, because that had to be beneficial to have like such a talented actor like he was, you know, guiding you along the way. It was, and, and it was definitely more on the career and management and money, watch your money, be careful of mother type of advice. He wouldn't uh, teach me how to read a scene. Um, the uh, pr you know, proclivities are different than they were, you know, 100 years ago when he was making movies. So um, he couldn't really teach me how to act. He did teach me how to steal the scene and upstage people though. That's always come in handy. <laughs> so Keith, um, you obviously became very big in the eighties, but I mean, talk to me a little bit about the seventies. Like you mentioned 77, that Adam's family movie, you were probably seven years old at the time. I mean, how did, how did work come about for you in the late seventies? 
Uh, it started in getting an agent uh, a- after I'd done a stand-in commercial, stand-in on a McDonald's commercial, but it I wasn't union, and uh, we had trouble getting paid after that. And uh, everyone said, "Well, he has to go union, and that won't be a problem." So um, we did that. We got an agent. I could read really well um, at five or six. My union card says join 1976. So I was six years old when I got my union card and uh, went up for um, commercials at first. Uh, McDonald's and uh, Ice Krispies and Sugar Corn Pops. And I did um, about 100 commercials in uh, 10 years between 76 wow. and 86 was my last. My last commercial was a McDonald's commercial as well. And uh, that's a great way to get your feet wet and learn the set and the camera and, and uh, filmmaking techniques. Commercials are quick, man. There's you know way more than 30 cuts in a 30-second commercial. They're quick shots, and they're telling a lot of information. Um, and uh, movies are just 90-minute commercials, and they just hide the fact that they're selling all the cars and the clothes and the beer that they're showing in the movie. Um and uh, then you move up to the family. So there, here's your career trajectory as you do commercials. Then you do guest appearances on TV shows. And I started doing um, great shows. Uh, Chips and Love Boat, Fantasy Island, Eight is Enough, More Community, Laverne and Shirley, uh, Walton's, Little House on the Prairie. And uh, uh, loved doing, because a lot of these shows I watched as a kid. So it was always fun being on those yeah, and interestingly enough, Keith, uh, you talk about the McDonald's commercials. I asked Don most this when I had him on my show because he did a couple uh, food commercials as well. Um, did you eat that food a lot when uh, you were doing those commercials? Yeah. I, I would imagine you did, right? Yeah, and it comes down to whether you have a line after you take a bite or not, if you need yeah. a spit bucket. So the if you don't have a line if you just kind of take a bite and go mm, you know it's delicious you can um just spit use the spit bucket but if you have to say a line you know mm, this is delicious then you had to swallow and that the worst was um Kool-Aid commercial and a little 8 ounce glass but it's me like sideways drinking the Kool-Aid and the, oh my whole camera went nuts and uh <laughs> we did 8 takes of drinking an eight ounce glass. So that's 64 ounces. Wow. Yeah. Uh, in half an hour. And then they go, uh, okay, we got it. Lunch. So uh, <laughs> I remember just, you know, fried chicken, uh, buttermilk biscuits, cookies. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the food is, every kid actor will definitely tell you that working with food is, uh, can be a challenge. Yeah, but we absolutely. learn tricks. Yeah. The uh, milk in cereal is made out of heavy cream. It looks better on camera. And the uh, butter on a toast in a breakfast commercial, you know how they always say, you know, good with the balanced breakfast. That is a little pat of cheese cut out, and then they use a little blowtorch to melt it a little. And then it stays that way all day under the hot lights because if you use real <laughs> butter, it would just melt. So everything else is really the food. It's just hero versions of it the best bun that came out with the best patty with the best you know sesame seed placement it has to be natural so they just make a hundred of them and then the director picks out the best looking one right and i mean you know you have to kind of get your feet in the door so you have to do these type of commercials i mean did you enjoy doing them i mean i'm sure some of them you know were probably tedious but did you enjoy doing them for the most part Oh, sure. And you got to work with um, other celebrities that, you know, were uh, slumming down and uh, selling stuff again. Henry Fonda, uh, Viewmaster Viewer commercial, one of the first things I did. And uh, who else was hawking stuff? Um, oh, uh, Elizabeth Montgomery, Samantha from Bewitched. And it was for Mother's Cookies. And they said it's only going to air in Japan. And. Um, we filmed it in front of the old bewitched house. We had to do the freeze and, you know, while they move stuff around and then unfreeze. Uh, and uh, I did uh, Toyota commercials that had the same effect and it would go bong and the whole car would just turn <laughs> into a chassis. Yeah. 
Yeah. And yeah so Keith, the, the commercials are super fun. Right. And Keith, a, a lot of people may not know this, but I think nine or 10 years, you went by the name of Keith Mitchell. I don't think it was until 1986 that you took the Coogan name. So you were Keith Mitchell for a good nine or 10 years, correct? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, was that more or less because were you trying to like establish your own identity? I know like, you know, sometimes with when you I, name, I wasn't, uh, yeah, I wasn't, but my mom didn't, she said, there's nothing worse for an actor than to not know why they were cast in something. Yeah. And, um, and you know, there's a whole thing going around right now about Nepo babies. And so that was an easy way to, you know, kind of pay my dues in a weird yeah. anonymous way. Some producers knew they knew damn well who I was and others didn't know. And also they don't care at that point. This is TV and you know, that stuff was ancient history then. Right. And Keith, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, 1982. I believe you were 12 years old at the time and you won a young artist award for an episode you did in Knight Rider. And I remember that episode, but just talk about that and talk about working on a, successful series like that that was you know really popular i mean that had to be a lot of fun and then you win an award for it you had to feel like at 12 years old wow this is pretty cool i didn't feel that the um job i did on it was particularly challenging i thought that other kids had done guest actor spots and i i knew that the awards were more of a popularity contest they're not voted on by any like kid union or anything like that it's a handful of parents kind of picking it i was very appreciative i love it it was also the same year that my grandfather won a lifetime achievement award from the same yeah. outfit and uh so after we got our awards and we're together uh, i was very proud i goes look grandpa you know we both have awards mine's just like yours and he goes no they're not the same you won yours. I earned mine. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's he's trying to school me at twelve years old, um, but it was fun. And I had lost out, you know, tons of times. We've had uh, movies up or been nominated for other stuff, and but um, for babysitter movies and stuff. And um, uh, it's nice to have a, a youth in film award. Yeah, and you know, Keith, early on in your career, you have to do like you said a lot of guest spots. That's how you kind of get your foot in the door. And, you know, I remember mm -hmm. an episode, I remember an episode of Growing Pains. I think it was that contest with Seavers against the, uh, I'm trying to remember the last name of uh, your The favorite. Cleavers. The Cleavers, yeah. And it was really funny. And I mean, you were so hilarious in that episode. So, I mean, you know, you proved that you could do a mixture of things. You could do drama, you could do comedy. But I mean, as a young actor early on, I think people really could see that you were going to be something in this business. Would you agree? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I know, but uh, no, it was just, you just work begat work. So the more you worked, the more you worked and uh, the more you're seen, I work against you. There are directors that don't want any baggage that comes with, you can't be Richie Cunningham and just walk out was, as a matter of fact, warned uh, my family warned me never get, too known for one role and it could kind of kill it they said don't get hot because if you get hot in your career you can go cold so you just want to be warm for your whole life <laughs> so i'm very proud to have a nice warm career yeah absolutely so i mean let's talk about the 80s keith because that was a when you talk about child actors, I mean, that was a who's who of child actors, and you're included in that list. And I mean, I always think of that babysitting movie, how good it was, and you're rooting for the character Brad to get the girl Chris, and you know that, like, she, she finds him to be too young for her, but I mean, it was just a great storyline, and I mean, just a wonderful movie. I mean, how much fun did you have doing that movie? Oh, um. It uh, was a blast. Um, and uh, and Brad is, you know, not the good guy. He is possessive. He covets her. He, uh, I think he's pretty entitled. Like, I like her so much. I'm not, my wife is mad at me for trying to make Brad is not the hero happen. I thought it would be interesting, you know. Fine, Brad's the hero. He stands up to the, to the, to the gang and he, 
tries to protect them all and, uh, you know, save his sister. Fine, he's the hero. But he doesn't get the girl. No. But, but he that does was, get I, That's her. what I loved about it. I loved yeah. the little bittersweet ending. Yeah. Now, let me ask you. If you were just a viewer watching that movie, <laughs> would you be disappointed didn't if happen. you didn't get... <laughs> would you be disappointed no, if you not didn't get the girl? No. No, I mean, that's... Um, it's like Ducky in... Uh, uh, 16 Candles. Um, if, you know, the lead, if she's got a choices to make between her ex-boyfriend who's a jerk, this snot-nosed kid that's, you know, uh, hitting on her and, while she's babysitting him, and then uh, the hero guy, the frat guy that comes and helps him out with money and gives him a ride, and it's like, you know, she kisses him on the uh, driveway at the end. So um, I think they're rooting for Chris to you know, find a guy that's right for her. You, you know, another movie, um, Keith, that you were hysterical in was Mom or Mom. Don't tell the baby. Don't tell Mom the babysitter's dead. And I mean, your character was hilarious. You had the long hair. I mean, it was a different character for you that you got to play. You kind of had to play that like lazy kid who didn't want to do anything. Mean, but you were tremendous in that. Talk about that movie because that was really a great class. Well. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. We just saw. Dog Gone, the Rob Lowe uh, missing dog movie, and it was directed by Stephen Herrick, who had directed Bill and Ted's Adventure, Three Musketeers, and he directed uh, Don't Tell Mom Babysitters. Did he just had a nice, you know, light tone? Um, it you know, it's kids, so everything's pretty dramatic, but get a way of grounding them. Um, they didn't feel like characters, caricatures. They were not cardboard cutouts. Kids, each kid had their kind of, you know, a couple of layers. And uh, the studio notes were, they loved the working girl, secret of my success storyline. They're like, we're also liking the family stuff. So they added uh, a couple more stuff for the family to kind of, so you could kind of bounce back and forth between the two. And it's just a really well-written script. Um, the writers wrote every line together uh, and um, would role play and like bounce dialogue back. And so just every scene, there's five quotes on every page. And you know what I thought about that movie too, is that was a great way for Christina Applegate to have this uh, breakout movie because she was on Married with Children. And she hadn't really done many movies and she got to have this big breakout movie where she was the star in the movie and she did a tremendous job as well and i really yeah, felt that that you know was good for her because it allowed her to play a different character and you know do a movie as well oh for sure she had done a film called streets i think but it was like a teenage runaway movie and good drama and um i don't know if it was like a studio picture uh and don't tell mom was well, big. It was you know Warner Brothers. Um, as a matter of fact, it was they had approached the dad uh, Bundy on Ed uh, Ed uh, O'Neill. Yeah, Ed O'Neill. Yeah, yeah. And he said um, he gave the script to Christina Applegate. Yeah. Wow. And that's how she got on it and interested. And um, yeah, it was it's her project all the way. She carried that movie easily. An interesting note, her personal assistant was Lori Depp, Johnny Depp's ex. <laughs> You'll see it in the credits next time you watch it. Yeah. And let me ask you this. Yeah, Depp. Now that I, I mentioned these two movies and they were great movies. A lot of people loved them. But I, you know, critics sometimes could be harsh with some of these movies. They've done it over the years. What is your opinion on critics? I mean, does it bother you ever, or do you look at it as they really don't understand what movies are about? You, you know, there's art artists that don't watch their own movies or don't read any of their reviews, and that's nice. I mean, I do it for the audience. I want to make sure that they're, you know, uh, enjoying it, and um, so you do, you read reviews and you always want to get mentioned in a good way. Um, I had done a play and they uh, made up a bad review for a paper that didn't exist and then wouldn't show it to me. 
they're like, but well, no, all the reviews are great. Four stars, you know, packed houses, the place running great, everyone's getting along. And too well. So it was removing the conflict from the play. People were walking out on stage and going, oh, hey, Steve. Oh, hey, Keith. What's going on? Like, because we were, you know, kind of successful. And they go, well, there is that one review. What? Oh, no, we can't let them read it. No, we can't. Like, just, you don't, you can't, you don't want to read such a bad review. We're like, really? Uh, later, they told me that they completely made it up. So um, <laughs> it can spin you. It can because there's could be some, doing you could be doing something that the director likes or that works for the play, and one reviewer you know says something, and all of a sudden you stop doing that behavior, or um, you change something for a critic who's there to be critical. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's funny when they'll be reviewing, you know. Uh, the onion fields or the killing fields uh, and uh, <laughs> the untouchables. And then don't tell all the babysitters dead. Um, so it did. The, the movies got um, well, at one point, eventually babysitting got a negative three. I think Franklin gave it a zero. Um, and then don't tell mom. I think one, I got a thumb up. And a thumb down for Siskel and Ebert. Not sure. I think one of them saw it for the escapist fair that it is. And um, although I had done serious after school specials, about, you know, drunk driving, and, you know, McCarthyism and pesticides and whatever serious topic an after school special takes on, um, I think that movies are, I don't know if you've seen Sullivan's Travels, sometimes people just want to laugh sometimes they just need to escape they don't need a real world movie yeah. you know trauma and so i love comedies and um uh i i feel i uh like to support lead actors and be the best friend or the brother or whatever boyfriend whatever it is it's a lighter workload and you can't steal the scenes if you're in every scene so i love being a supporting actor and uh the, uh, and I am, of course, looking to do the third movie in my Babysitter trilogy. Right. You know, Keith, uh, one movie, the, the movie that I love that you were in more than any other movie you did was Toy Soldiers. And yeah, what a what a terrific movie from start to finish. And I mean, your character nailed it so well in that movie. I mean, he's pretending to have asthma to kind of throw the terrorists off and it's a group of boys trying to save their school from these terrorists who come in and i mean just the storyline was great and i mean think about the people you worked with in that movie lewis gossett jr oh, yeah. you know sean astin will wheaton i mean the list goes on and on of just, i think mason adams might have been in it but i mean there were just mason so adams many- arlie ermy denim elliott yeah. uh andrew devoff it was a great cast. And, you know, the thing I loved about the movie, too, is and the name is escaping me right now, the character name. But the one guy that you guys in the movie kind of pick on in the beginning and then he ends up, Yeah. And I unfortunately, I think that actor passed away, uh, you know, many years ago. But I mean, he did a great job in that movie as well. And just seeing the bond that the, the boys all had with each other after, you know, they realized they accomplished what they needed to accomplish. I mean, just a tremendous movie. Talk about that movie because from start to finish, like I said, it was riveting. Oh, it's fun. It's I. It's a hard R. I think it's one of the last of the like hard R, late eighties, early nineties um, action movies, and it's got good like you know bullet hits to the head and rockets and and lots of explosions and. Um, you know, it's the kid's fantasy to Rambo it up or, you know, Die Hard. We called it Dead Poet Society meets Die Hard. <laughs> and uh, it was taken as seriously as you take a cheesy B-movie for adults. You know, uh, a canon picture, say, with lots of explosions and maybe Chuck Norris here or there. So it was, it was fascinating when, um, oh God, he played Will Wheaton's dad, uh, Jerry Orbach. Yeah, Jerry and he Orban. went. Yeah. He he asked to be uncredited. Yeah, I that that was interesting. Yeah, bizarre. And he didn't get it's got it tongue planted firmly in its cheek. I mean, uh, Andrew Devoff got it. He said it's one of his favorite parts to ever play, even though it's the bad guy. 
um, so many great bits of dialogue. Like you Americans uh, always say that, that, don't you? But you never actually do it. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, we will hunt you down and we will kill you. So great. And the director, Dan Petrie Jr., who's dear friend, and he wrote Beverly Hills Cop, and uh, he wrote um, The Big Easy, and uh, Turner and Hooch. His brother, Donald Petrie, uh, directed um, Grumpy Old Men, and their father, Dan Petrie Sr., uh, has been in the business for you know decades and decades, and a classic filmmaker and director so it's the whole family of people and the writer was david kep who yep. went on to write i don't know jurassic park a couple of other movies <laughs> so and, it was um it, and backed by tristar and uh, mark bird was producing he went on to run island uh pictures and um it had a young diverse cast uh yeah it was um it's it's fun. People find it. And they're like this, you know, under what do they call it? Underrated. And I'm like, yeah, it was rated exactly what it should have been. It made its money back. Didn't yeah. run away at the box office, but uh, nobody lost their shirt on it, and they and, spent good money. And the other thing too is that background music was tremendous. You know, they you yeah, know, you get like that those goosebumps like when you know they're celebrating together and stuff like that. It was just, and the thing about those kids in that movie, yourself and everybody else is you didn't, you really didn't see any kid in that movie have any fear. They were not afraid of these, you know, Oh no, snuff. I, my character was, my character would immediately (laughs) raise his hands and give up and rat people out. He was, you know, but it is that he thinks he's a tough guy. And I love that. um, The director let me uh, spit. Like after the you know terrorists walk by and I hawk a loogie, my yeah. character thought he was a tough guy. Um, and what I loved, there was a moment we had a second unit, um, and it was directed by Mickey Moore, and he's stunt coordinator, and uh, he had directed the truck chase sequence in Raiders of the Lost Ark, and we were shooting two sets at once, and Mickey would kind of set up the set. And then the director would kind of run over and look and see if everything's good and run back to whatever the main set was doing. And so I was directed by the same guy that directed the truck chase sequence in Raiders of the Lost Ark. I I thought that was really cool. And it was the part where I come down and light the cigarette and leave it for the smoke alarm and all that. This is coffee. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, just a classic movie. And I mean, again, a lot of times movies and TV shows, they do so much better when they're shown in syndication or they're shown on tv more so than maybe they do in the box office but then they become these cult classics and i really believe toy soldiers is a cult classic because to this day people still watch it 30 years later they uh grabbed queen latifah to sign on as headmistress for a girl soldiers sequel and i i said as long as it's all of our kids then uh, that's great. You know, uh, Louise yeah. Callie's daughter wants revenge. And so she goes and kidnaps all of the daughters of Billy Tepper and Joey Trotta. And <laughs> Joey's got a twin, twin brother, Jimmy, who Joey wasn't really into the mafia, but Jimmy is a made man played by Will Wheaton. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Sn- Snuffy will be back. Um, uh, they, uh, as soon as the invasion happens, we get, you know, hurried tests from our daughters we run out to the school to save them and immediately get caught and we find out that our daughters are um had run off into the forest and we're living off the land and you know safe and they find out that we're kidnapped and the daughters break back into the school to rescue their dads and that's my yeah. my plot for uh girl soldiers <laughs> it's not a bad one for sure so let me ask you keith um <laughs> in um 2023 as we speak what has keith coogan got planned coming up that people can look forward to oh uh great fun couple of movies team of two uh a detective that can't keep a partner so he goes through like 19 different partners um and uh, wrong reasons um which is a scary uh, punk rock scary kind of movie um directed by josh roush 
sorry, Liv Roush, produced by Liv Roush. Um, and it is a guy that kidnaps a Britney's uh, rock star uh, to try to get her clean. And he knows it's not going to end well. And Ralph Garman plays the lead detective, and it's one of the best acting jobs, not just for Ralph Garman. It's a great job. Ralph is fantastic. He is a leading man. He is a star. He's a superstar. And it had debuted at the Smod Castle, the new theater in Jersey, uh, the Kevin Smith Theater. Oh, and uh, nice. uh, yeah. couple, what else was I doing? Oh, um, looking at uh, American Spark. And it is a guy that borrows his girlfriend's electric car. And uh, it's. Um, then he gets invited to a bunch of events one night. And of course, he's got to charge it and runs out of battery and all that other good stuff. So, <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> we'll see if that like, helps sell some Teslas. <laughs> well, it sounds like you still keep busy. And Keith, one thing I thought about um, they had this new Netflix series that revolves around the character Wednesday Adams. But one thing that has to happen, in my opinion, before you end your career is you have to play some type of Uncle Fester, whether it's in a mini series, a Netflix series, or a film. But you need to play the part of Uncle Fester because that would be so cool to see your grandfather who played it in the early 60s and then his grandson plays it in the 21st century. I think that needs to happen. What are your thoughts about that? I love it. I'm down. Um, you know that he was, my grandfather was 50 when he began playing uncle fester and when the series ended he was 52 uh i'm turning i just turned 53 so i'm already old enough to play uncle fester uh i've got the <clears throat> vocal cords morticia shoot him in the back uh, i'm ready to go I'm ready well, to go we just got to get the bald cap and the whole deal well, I really hope that happens, but Keith, I really do appreciate you giving me uh, a few minutes today. You're a credit to the business. I love watching you and everything you do, and I really appreciate you coming on today to give me a few minutes, and I look forward to seeing you continue a great career, so thank you for coming on again. I appreciate it. Thanks for great research. I really appreciate that, and uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Keith. I appreciate it. Well, folks, that's the one and only Keith Coogan for In the Spotlight. I'm Mike Canici saying good night, everyone.